Hajra and Armando land on the western shores of the Boyonogo River next to a weather-aged stone watermill that could have been conjured from a painting. A wood-carved shingle with blue laddering hangs, clattering in the wind next to the door. It reads the Dottage Mill Cafe and Bakery. A Targonian couple watch nervously from the front door as the flying pair land. Yogo, wife and restaurateur, dressed in knee-length blue Ankara floral dress and a matching long flowing scarf waves. Welcome. Dinner for two? Your best table, please. Ush, husband and chief, wrapped in a crisp, clean, white baker's apron with beanie, gives his wife a nervous glance before retreating inside. The cobbled patio overlooking the river is just large enough for a single two-person table and nothing else. Armando holds the seat for Hajra before claiming his. The sound of slapping waters off the rotating wheel and the persistent grinding of wood gears drowns out the distant music and spirited voices from the barbarian celebration. I take it you're escaping those loud barbarians. Yogo lights a candle in the center of the table. Them young guys been plastering bills all over town advertising the event, screaming from every corner. Koshuk said they were even paying folks to attend. Who gets paid to go to a party? Guaranteed success, I suppose. Smart if you have the money. Hmm, a waste of money. My husband, Ush, is our baker and cook, trained in the Blue Moon Institute of Bakery and Culinary Arts. Dedicated to his life, making people's tummies happy. We maybe eat small, but we have big flavors. She ain't lying. The best egg bread in all of Samaria. Ush appears, carrying a cutting board laden with golden delicious agigi bread and a pot of tea. Placing it on the table, he bows and retreats. Our dinner menu this evening is a lamb stew with dumpling and shlapla flakla food salad. Their lamb stew is simply divine. Slaughter all the lambs, I don't care. Oh, sounds scrumptious. Armando is preoccupied by the vibrant river vista and the active animal life that lives upon it. We'll take two and a bottle of your best M.E.U.'s Rouge Vif. After Yogo scurries away, Hajra takes Armando's hands into hers. It's charming, no? Armando pries his attention away from the river and falls into even larger radiant pools. Hajra's expressive deep brown eyes. Oh, beautiful and charming. You have a you have a wonderful singing voice. You are naturally gifted or you have professional training? I'd like to think I'm a literal of both. The University of Dorsang, mm -hmm. class of 39 with distinction. She leans close, elbows flat on the table, chin cupped in her hands as she slowly chews bread. What other gifts do you have with distinction? Her eyes flutter, expressive and delightful. A playful smirk dances on the edges of her upturned lips. I recently took the Apollo Creed. Standing, he brandishes his singing blade and strikes a dramatic thespian pose. From Muromaki to Dorsang Isle, I pursue evil with a smile. Let those who strive by doing wrong be where my power. Apollo's song! Apollo, as in the Olympian god. Oh, I am a student of Apollo, the oracle god of music, song, and poetry. My creed duty is to seek out and destroy evil wherever it hides its dastardly plans. Armando hacks wildly at the air, mocking, dueling evil. Hajra coughs, eyes bulging slightly, and takes a quick nip of tea. You are a pentavolo. Yogo interrupts, clears her voice from the door. <clears throat> I'm sorry. We're out of Rouge Vif. We have my singing red bling. No, no, that simply won't do. Um, oh, I know just the thing. She swiftly strikes her bracers together, rubbing fiercely. Primi, get your puny ass out here. A puff of flash powder startles Armando. He jumps when Yogo shrieks. A glowing white hot energy ball forms in the air, engulfed in dancing red-yellow flames. Hurry up! 
a tiny cherub creature appears, floating, an angelic human toddler with white stubby wings. But the cherub's face is twisted in a conflagration of flame and pain. Its mouth, jacked, contorted, issues a soul-rending shriek, that of a witch baby burning at the stake. Uh, uh, mommy! A piece of melted skin, liquid porcelain drips from the end of its nose. Uh, uh, Apollo, have mercy! Uh, don't worry, he's harmless. Armando hands the cherub a glass of water. The baby snatches it, emptying its cool contents over his head with a hiss. This your latest victim? He is my date, if you must know. Be respectful. Now, remember that Amian vineyard, Chateau de Dragon? What about it? You go there directly and get me a case of that rouge vif. And, um, oh, the, the manipulator special. Am I paying or stealing? She swats him on the ass. What do you think? Poof, he's gone. Why, he seemed, um, rather discordant. Yeah, it's a sad life being a demon, but he is my friend. With the demon gone, Yogo returns with a bowl of stew and fruit, placing them in the center of the table. We serve family stone. They dig in. But before Armando manages a single mouth-watering bite, crash! A burning wood crate strikes the floor hard, spilling bottles rattling across the terrace. Put it out! Put it out! Hazra does as requested. With mystical energy control, she douses the crate and the straw packing material. Not, not the wine, me! Hazra seems unconcerned with Primi's torment. She motions a bottle of wine to Yogo, lurking, scared, in the door. Open this, please. You may keep the rest. Primi, still screaming, Hajra waves casually, extinguishing the head-melting flames. Where's the manipulator special? Primi points to an arrow protruding from his side. The chateau installed better defenses since last we were there. Primi is covered in blood, and not just his. They had guards! I emphasize had, uh, summarily dispatched with a couple, you know, of other, you know, great people. You didn't kill the Vintner, did you? Of course not, no. At least I don't think so. With a heavy sigh, Hajra sends the cherub away, just as Yogo returns with a wine decanter and goblets. And Tavolo are demon summoners? Hajra swirls the wine in her goblet before drinking. Does that bother you? Everyone should be loved, especially unlovable sorts. This demon definitely, definitely qualifies as needing love. Demons are cool, like your sword or your mandolin, meant to be used, played. But uh, he is redeemable, yes. Hajra refills her glass. Tell yourself what you need to tell yourself. Since Break Twina's wild hunt announcement, the Barbarians' party in the arena has not slowed. In fact, if anything, it has intensified. There is power drinking, drug use, fights, inhibitions discarded with clothing as people pair off. The Barbarian crew, minus Armando, remain safe behind VIP ropes with vigilant Barbarian bouncers. What do you think Brigthwena meant? Welcome to my pack. I believe she was speaking metaphorically. Oh no, there were deeper intentions behind those words. I agree. Kalsimir's eyes dart, tracking danger, movement. Druid senses tingling, claw spins. Target acquired. Razine sits into a chair next to the others. Congratulations. You appear to be doing quite well. Remarkably so. Yes, we won. We won the tournament. Victorious. We are the champions, my friend. That is fame and fortune and everything that comes with it. It's been no bed of roses. And it's not been a pleasure cruise. I assume then 
we will be seeing a return on the investment soon. Awkward silence. Drunk awkward silence. Yeah. The interest we're certain can be repaid, but we'll need more time to cover the original outlet. We've only just received the down payment of our winnings, but there is more to come. Cool. We ask you to maintain expenditures and receipts. I trust you have done this. I don't want to interrupt the festivities any longer this evening, but I wish to meet with uh, you in the morning to review expenses. Augie steps forward, bows. Law, as you ordered, I have all the receipts organized and ready for your convenience. Bless you, Agi. You are my friend. Definitely my favorite. Pansy opens a bulging purse at her hip, spilling a cascade of coins on the ground as she rifles through it for a tip. Razin is quite astonished at the size of the tip Pansy passes to Agi. Well done, Agi. The barbarians meet Razin the next morning in the Three Sisters Tap House. Late, late morning, since none of the barbarians were in any condition to wrap their heads around finances any earlier. The friends stumble, morning drunk, into a private room. Augie is there, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, with receipts well-organized. Are you sure you don't have a dwarf in you somewhere? Claw enters, trips, and almost falls on the table. Oh, hydrate. Claw chugs a tall glass of water and motions to a young server delivering breakfast food. I want all your water. You planned this early on purpose. The barbarian grunts, heaps blood sausages on his plate. Eat breakfast, everyone. We have this handled. Razin and I speak the same language. Later, Razin and Agi are hip deep into the receipts by the time Armando, Pansy, and Calcimere find the room. Razin picks up a large parchment, scans and studies the bottom line. 5,000 torts. 5,000 torts for the arena rental seems exorbitant, sure, but Augie quenches Razin's objections with a fistful of alcohol sales, demonstrating the cost was covered. A flying circus? How much for bees? Acrobat bees! What is a party without entertainment? Why throw a party in the first place? I pay you to earn, make money, not to expend it like drunken orcs. All the barbarians gear up to take on the fight with Razine, but Augie waves them down calmly. The barbarians are a brand. Their name has value. The news of the barbarians' exploits have spread all over Graver's Day. Everyone has heard of their record shattering hunt. And last night's celebration with Rick Buena's toast? You can't buy that kind of publicity. You know what this means, right? Razin shakes his head. He knew where this was heading, but let the lad continue. If you want results, they don't come for free. Razin wasn't buying whatever Augie was selling. Listen, Mr. Razin, sir, five nobodies fresh off the boat is just another five nobodies fresh off the boat. Gravers dig chews up gravers and would-be hunters faster than they can arrive. Infamous! I'm famous. That's my job. Okay, this is blarney politics. All this money is what? Advertising? Purchasing authority? Which is the intent to spend into what? It gets us in the door. A seat at the table. It's a conversation starter. Besides, I'm a bloody damn dwarf. Money will follow. Okay. Okay, color me interested. And for the next half hour, Augie and Razin duel until they finally finish balancing the books, as it were. You have extra cash, which needs to be returned to Malika as a demonstration of the size of her initial investment. I have money from the blunder with the healing potions. I can add in another 500. How about we make this easy and everybody just gives me half of your money? Well, that simplified things all right. Everyone did as instructed, forking over 50%. Are we done here? Now that money matters have been put to bed, Razin studies the room coolly, each barbarian in turn. Pansy, 
this dagger that you picked up. Pansy stiffens, deer in the bullseye lantern lights. Yeah. I know you have it. Don't worry, I don't want it. I'm not even going to touch it. I just want to see it. She gently removes the dagger from the scabbard at her waist and places it on the table before him. Pansy slowly retracts her hand, which remains on a hair trigger. It's just a dagger. (laughs) No, Pansy, not just a dagger. Razine's eyes are no longer human, but instead are glistening golden gemstones with faceted pupils. He stares intently at the dagger, eyes wide, calculating. Magical? Claw and Calcimer lean over the table, giving the dagger a closer look for the first time. To be honest, I don't know for sure. I can't tell from this dagger, but that is what makes it intriguing. You aren't able to discern anything at all. Pansy, what did you take? Is it cursed? I don't know. I will tell you, however, to demonstrate our commitment to an open relationship so that you don't betray us. A shadow haunts Kalsomir's worried features. What does that mean? This dagger cannot be easily divine. And that's the reason why Malika sent me, because her methods of tracking people failed. Torgrim slams the table with his tankard. You were tracking us? <laughs> of course we were tracking you. Don't be naive. Torgrim growls and takes a slow drink, eyeballing Razine over the lip. Except you weren't. Or you couldn't. That's why you're here? This dagger obstructs certain types of divinations. So, so what? It has like an anti-Big Brother enchantment or something? And not just you. This particular influence appears to be an AOE. An AO what? Area of effect. Area of effect. Uh, singing is an area of effect. I don't know the limitation of this dagger, but it seems to hamper, to prohibit the ability to track you, monitor you, eavesdrop Scry on you, magically. Storytelling is also an area of effect. Well, here you do balls, Armando. Everything you do is an area of effect. Well, me. Fancy, you stole this dagger from an Amian national. Is that right? Yeah, Declamont. He's no longer with us. What happened to him? He was eaten. The bard dives into the story with great flair and aplomb, explaining how the Atars attacked and killed Pierre de Clamont and his duelist friends. It was not my fault. I didn't kill him. Of course not, Pansy. In the dark of winter, you just stole his coat. And he froze to death. Oh, he was an asshole, remember? The Atars did us a damn favor. Aemians and Atars are natural rivals from the same island continent. You see, they hated each other. Razine studies Torgrim. Pansy isn't the only one with a special blade. I heard you have a new friend as well. I do. Would you like to meet Fang? Razine holds up his hands in defense and then slaps the table, smiling broadly. Well then, Balberius, you may keep these items, assuming payments continue to go on with no increased liabilities. You never mentioned anything about any liabilities. Let's hope that the Clements are a family of lesser influence, resources, and clout. It would do none of us any good if they sent the Hound of Tindalos after you. Oh, yes. That would really suck. But, I mean, it's not like a Fomorian demigoddess didn't just, I don't know, kidnap a family member. To say, Togrom, you're indeed the infamous. Tell me, Razine, 
Does Rahat have any relationship with the Cloud Forge clan? Razin retreats into his thoughts, momentarily contemplative. Had Torgrim hit upon something unintended? Cloud, Cloud Forge is one of the wealthiest families in Chaldea. Malika Rahat is the merchant's guild master of Andalus, and as such, she has business dealings with your clans. That is a very diplomatic and politically astute way of putting it. <laughs> Malika is a business woman. She has no friends, only mutual interests. Torgrim, why do you bring up your clan? I thought you were clanless. Oh, my cousin, Soraka Cloudforge. She was recently taken prisoner by Brick Thwena. Razin blinks and then blinks again, absorbing the news. She is the heir to your clan. Can you tell me more about their situation? Clan Cloudforge owns Graver's team. Brick Thwena, before she was exiled by Emperor Padova, leased the land. However, since her return, she has reneged on payment. As Raka, well, she was sent to negotiate a new lease agreement. Brick Thwena took umbrage and captured Soraka and her elite dwarven host, Clarks. If this information gets out, they will be held to pay. Torgrim is hoping to metaphor the situation, kill two birds with one stone, save his cousin, and pay off debts to Rahad. If we can return Soraka to her family, uh, the clan would be incredibly grateful. And, and such that I think it would it would wipe our debt out to us. If you have a viable plan to break Soraka free, should it become a positive outcome, of course, that should settle your debt. Our investigation plans should include Pansy and her cone of silence dagger. Good point, Armando. Everyone. Stay within 120 feet of Pansy, approximately. Approximately, sure. We're a small group of not particularly powerful individuals, to be frank. Okay? And Frank says, we need allies. Everyone nods, recognizing the wisdom of his words. Now, luckily, I'll have a line on me. Cosmo has a meeting room where we can meet up with folks with mutual interests. Folks, what kind of folks? Sergacious and Sally. Oh, what? No, no way. You mean Team Invisibility, who stole our referee? I know you know this. I'm just making sure there aren't two sagacious wizards. Well, about. Now, listen, now, here's how I'm approaching this. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And we know Sagacious has already taken action against Brick Wano once, and at least to this point, he's gotten away with it. He's got a huge bounty on his head. Every Tom, Dick, and Harriet is trying to find him to collect the reward. Would uh, you guys be interested in meeting him? No! I mean, oh my goodness. Cosmo believes him an ally. What? He thinks we should meet him and he wants to meet with us. I say we do it. Razine stands. Bored, tired, both. I'm going to leave the door of plausible deniability ajar. Send Gekko an update. I'll be at the good Hotel Cheon. After a casual, nonchalant mosey across Graver's Dig, our heroes arrive at Cosmos Tower. Torgrim enters first to establish contact, set up the confidential sit-down with Sagacious the Wizard. Later, but not that much later, our heroes loiter outside the tower, not so nonchalantly, kind of conspicuous in the open. Torgrim returns. It's a go. I'll go first. Reconnoiter the other side. Next bond man, then sticky fingers. Pop our bite and count, you bring up the rear. Cosmos Tower exists many places at once. How many and where, Cosmo would not reveal. 
The Gargoyle Tower is in Graver's Dig, of course, duh. Another clone copy, the Dragon Tower, is in Tartu, a mystical hamlet in the Garon Forest, known as a magnet for seers, cultists, magicians, and other fanatics. Cosmo grants the Barbarians passage through his tower, one person at a time. In the briefest of moments, all five of the Barbarians make the quick journey from Graver's Dig to a clearing by Cosmo's Dragon Tower in Tartu. Rather uneventful, actually. Claw excitedly rolls around in the grass like a puppy reunited with its owner. Home sweet home. The clearing is alive with vibrant wildlife, birds and little forest critters running around playfully. We see Cosmo's tower with a tiny green dragon perched above the door. Behind it is a large dark form? A wall? Hey, back up! I can't see it! You're too close! No, back! Way, way up! Further than that! Go to the other side of the clearing! Yeah, that's it! Whoa! Now we can see the dark form isn't a tree, it's a root. A titanic root, 1,000 feet tall. It's the mother tree. Everyone spins. Where did he come from? Or Idrisil, some say. Chaldea's connection point to the Pearl Universe. Friends, this is the real deal. The root, not this clown. Sagacious gestures to a round table with comfy leather chairs of various sizes erected on the lawn outside the tower. In one of the smaller chairs sits Sally. Hey, y'all, y'all. There are groans all around as the barbarians find a chair that fits their species. <laughs> Oh, real sorry we didn't get to fight last time, but we can try again, we can try again. <laughs> Sally was like a pet dog when their master returned home, rambunctious and ready to jump all over them. No, Sally, no. No, Sally, no! No! Oh. oh, boy, you want to roll with another battle of wits, Missy? <laughs> Boring. We know who would win. A battle of wits. Yeah, these monkeys think they won a battle of wits. <laughs> I didn't even get to use my club. <laughs> a battle of wits requires intelligence, cleverness, for which you have neither. Sally leaps up on top of the table. Oh, I got wit. It's right here. Club wit. <laughs> Now I'll bludgeon you over the head with wit until you bleed out your ears. <laughs> Thorgrim pulls out Fang. Fair warning. I'm going to hit back with a metaphor. Ooh, a double-edged sword. Oh, that could help you or hurt you. <laughs> okay, okay. Sally, cool your heels. Or you're going back in the box. <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> Sally slowly climbs off the table and takes her seat. Thorgrim puts away his metaphor. Okay, wizard. Let's do business. Well, let me see. You figured the enemy of your enemy is your friend, right? Well, I'm pragmatic. I was hoping you would be open and clear-headed. Put off the awkward way in which we first met. The barbarians on this guy, though. Oh my gosh. Wow, wow. You're naturally concerned about your cousin. Well, do you have any idea where she's being held? Because I do. Oh? Let us compare notes. Well, I've learned that Brigitte keeps all her high-value targets in the Fey Realm. It's called the Plain of Annan. It's the other world of the Celtic gods. I don't know for certain, but... Rigthwana would certainly stash someone as valuable as Soraka Cloudforge there. Well, how do we get there? Can we go through Tartu? Certainly you could, if you had the proper pathway icons, which I do not. Do you know somebody who can? I, I know a different route. Sagacious smiles, devilishly smug. I'm all ears, says the one with the pointy ears. 
I've never been there, nor shall I risk it. But if you are young and foolish or adventurous enough that you wish to attempt it, I know how to send you there. Sagacious, what are your motivations? Why would you help us against you know who? I am her nemesis. Good for you. What does that mean? Uh, means we are enemies from long ago. <laughs> well, how does one exactly become an enemy of a demigoddess? I want to tell you, truly, because I want to increase your trust, but there are some secrets I am not prepared to share. Sagacious unfurls a map on the table of Graver's Dig and the surrounding territory. Anon can be accessed from unholy ground of the Celtic god of the dead, Aron. And it just so happens that there is unholy ground near Graver's Dig. The cemetery. In the center of that cemetery are burial mounds, and if we go there, I can plane shift you to the plain of Anon. How do we get back? Sagacious holds up a hand and whistles. A red-breasted robin flies across the clearing and perches on his outstretched finger. This is Lay. She's the spellcaster, and she can bring you back. The bird chirps excitedly at Sagacious, terribly excited about something. Go on now. It's okay. The robin leaps and flies over to Claw, landing on their shoulder. No. Hi there, little buddy. Aren't you cute? So you're going to bring us home? Fantastic. Now we have transportation. Sagacious, what else do you know about this strange world? Is it guarded? Better yet, is Soraka guarded? I know nothing about the plane, as I've never been there. You're going to be on your own, and you best do some research. Great. When it's time to go, I recommend we conduct the ritual during Brigthwinna's wild hunt. Hopefully, she'll be distracted with the ecstasy of the chase. That gives us a few extra luxury days to research, which I'm happy to do. Cosmo has a reasonable library. You may use it. Start with the obvious topics such as Anna, Otherworld, Around, Fomorians, Celtic religion. Sagacious, why don't you just come with us? We could use the help. Oh, yeah. Let's see if Sally's wit club is all that. <laughs> you witless wonders, don't you know what a planar constant is? <laughs> what she means is that if someone like myself with substantial spellcasting capabilities were to accompany you, paranormal alarm bells would alert Brig Thwena and destroy any chance of saving Soraka. Your best chance is for the five of you with the prodigal dagger to use its powers as cover and then slip in and slip out. Torgrim stands, pounding the table with the end of his sword. The next step, claw, library, research. Claw happily departs, eager to see what can be learned. Cosmo the Magnificent is also magnanimous and allows Claw entry to his private library. Cosmo gives Claw a clockwork librarian assistant who gathers books and tomes on Celts, which helps speed up the research tremendously. After a few glorious days of research, Claw returns to the Barbarians with knowledge and bundles of paper. I'm going to paraphrase, so keep up. Afterwards, you need to read this on your own time. You can read, Torgum. If not, Pansy can help you. Ha, <sighs> ha. I can bloody well read, Missy. Do you need help with any of the big words? I'm here for you, buddy. No, oh, you, you can kiss <laughs> my arse, too. <laughs> Okay. Aron is the Celtic god of the dead. Anon is his, um, oh, it's like his home plane, whatever that means. Everyone listens intently as Claude details what they learned. Anon is Celtic paradise. Peaceful, beautiful, nothing to fear by all accounts. Why would Brigtwina hide Soraka in a place that's so nice and hospitable to graver invaders? To us. Well, once a sagacious tosses us over the fence, I'd suspect there to be flaming pits or vaporous acid or carbolic particles. Prison in paradise is still a prison. If you're looking for heat, Armando, I did find a reference to a cauldron of inspiration. Hmm. Let's see here. It's housed in a stone pergola, which is, you know, like a large open-air pavilion for your troglodytes. 
and oh, the cauldron, which is profoundly large, is attended to by Pomerian maidens who breathe on it to keep it warm. It's all very transcendental and metaphysical. Oh, yes. Paradise and maidens. Down, boy. They probably have six-inch retractable fangs, and they eat bards for afternoon tea. Fa fingers the papers on the table. It's all in here, friend. Rita, knowledge is power. 